I want you to turn to a neighbor and say to him or her, make your life matter. All right. That's what I want to talk to you about for the next little while. When I was a youngster, we used to play a game, a children's game, hide and seek. Someone would cover his or her eyes and begin to count backwards while we scurried to try to find a place where we would not be discovered. And then came the ominous words that always caused the adrenaline to pump through my veins, ready or not. Here I come. Ready or not, if the Lord delays his coming, each of us will end up at a funeral. Our funeral. And at our funeral, the critical question is, Will my life have really mattered? Will your life have really mattered? I must be honest with you, at your funeral, no one is going to care about how much education you had. At your funeral, they're not going to be reading an introduction like Pastor Roman read about me today. In fact, as he was reading it, I was thinking that if I took one of my medals to Starbucks and held it up and said, I would like a cafe latte, they would say, certainly, uh, we'll take the medal and four dollars and you can have a cafe latte. No one's going to care about your awards. No one is going to care about what kind of car you drive. I've never heard at a funeral someone bragging, well, you know, he drives a Lexus. You're not driving anything anymore. The fact of the matter is, you can't take it with you. But praise God, you can send it ahead. Ah, <laughs> oh, hallelujah. If you lay up for yourselves not treasures on this earth, but invest in the kingdom to come, you can take it ahead. In fact, the Bible says, those who, who give to the poor, the book of Proverbs, those who give to the poor lend to the Lord. How would you like God having to say, I owe you? I'm going to pay back. I know I owe you. You have been giving so much to the hungry, to the strangers, to the sick, to the incarcerated, that the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God of the universe owes you. Will your life matter at your funeral? I stood in the Capitol Rotunda as the coffin of Rosa Parks went by. This African-American seamstress had a coffin put in a place of honor in the Capitol Rotunda. Marines stood at attention. The President of the United States and the First Lady walked in, and the President did not even have a speaking part. And you know it's a significant funeral 
when the President of the United States is there and the program says, you don't say anything. <laughs> that, that, that's the funeral right there. Okay. His responsibility was to take a read, place it by the coffin of Rosa Parks, come back and stand still and say nothing. I did have a speaking part. I offered a prayer. The thing that astonished me was not the beauty of the ceremony. The thing that astonished me was that five hours later when I turned on C-SPAN, people were still walking by that car. A continuous flow of grateful people to a woman who sat down in order that other Americans in this great land could stand up. And I thought to myself, here was a life that mattered. There is another life far more significant than that of Rosa Parks. Philip Brooks puts it this way, all of the armies that have ever marched, all of the navies that have ever sailed, all of the parliaments that have ever sat, all of the kings and queens that have ever reigned, have not made the impact upon humankind as has that one solitary life. The life of one who split history into B.C. and A.D. The life of our blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We look to him if we are to live a life that matters. He shows us how. And he said, here is the way anyone can live a life that matters. You are the salt of the earth. <laughs> if the salt loses its flavor, it is good for nothing but to be cast underfoot. You are the light. Joy of Troy, you are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden. If you are going to live a life that matters, you must be salt and light to the world. And how do you do that? First of all, you must bring distinctiveness to your world. You must bring what? And what does that mean? You've got to be different. Someone should know that you are a child of God. The Bible says you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people distinctive people in the group. I don't want any peculiar folk walking around here. <laughs> that you should do what? Show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be sufficient evidence to convict? Or would the judge have to say, you, you have given me no compelling evidence at all that this individual is a Christian? A summary judgment. Throw the case out. Daniel went to Babylon, a prisoner of war, a young man. He was invited to sit at the king's table to eat the king's ham sandwiches and to drink the king's Dom Perignon. It was a temptation for the lad, but Daniel chapter 1 says, Daniel 
purpose in his heart. To live a distinctive life, you must make up your mind in advance. You must resolve. Don't wait until the temptation strikes to decide what you are going to do. If you wait until you get up on Blueberry Hill, it's too late, as the philosopher Fats Domino would say. And so, the older folks know what I'm talking about. Fats Domino, who's that? Be distinctive. Be distinctive. For salt is contrasted with the food that it seasons. What if everything tasted like salt? What if salt was not distinctive? It would lose its power. Be distinctive. I was preaching in Baltimore, Maryland at the 50th anniversary of a particular church. They gave me the address of the church and I left home in a hurry and I forgot the paper with the address on it, but I did remember the street. And so I said, that's all right, I'll get on the street and I'll start asking people. And so I drove on to the street and I stopped and I asked the man, do you know where such and such a church is? And he said, no, I've never heard of it. I drove up. Five or six blocks, I stopped, someone else pulled over. Do you know where such and such a church is? No, I never heard of it. I drove another four or five blocks, and there were three ladies sitting on the steps of a neighborhood store, and I got out of the car, and I said, do you know where such and such a church is? This is a church that has been on, on the street for 50 years. And they said, no, we don't know where it is. And I got in my car and drove a half a block. And there was the church. Now, a half a block away, on the day of worship, there were three women seated who were unaware of what was going on in that church. I tell you, if the members were pulled into court, I don't think there would have been sufficient evidence to convict When you move into your new church, and I went by there last evening, I tell you, don't tell me there is not a God in heaven. <laughs> ah, hallelujah. I sure wish the real estate prices in D.C. were the same as up here. That's another story. Make an impact on the community. Make your life matter. Let somebody, even if you got to knock on doors and take a religious survey. We're just taking a demographic survey here. Someone ought to know that you love Jesus. Someone ought to know that he died for you. Someone ought to know that he puts peace in your heart. Someone ought to know that no one can give you the joy and the peace that he gives. Live distinctive. Bring distinctiveness to your world. But then, if you're going to make your life matter, bring flavor. Hallelujah. Bring flavor to your world. Some of the meanest people I have ever met are Christians. <laughs> oh, I tell you, we had some ushers in my church when I was growing up. It made you sad that you came to church. It just didn't have the gift. Bring flavor to your world. Imagine gravy without salt. Lord, that mercy makes, makes me tremble just to think about it. Even worse, imagine grits. Imagine grits without salt. I was at I hop and Los Angeles, California, and the waitress came to take my order, and I said, I'll have a bowl of grits, and she said, what are grits? <laughs> California is a strange land. A 
And then I went to Covington, Tennessee, and I went to the IHOP in Covington, Tennessee, and the waitress came out and said, what will you be having with your grits? I said, now that's what I'm talking about. Imagine grits without salt. We must bring flavor to our world. I was growing up in the inner city of Baltimore, Maryland. Sometimes my mother would announce to my siblings and me, children, we don't have any food in the house, so we are going to have to fast today. Now, my sisters and brothers, voluntary fasting is good for the soul. But that involuntary fasting, that's a, that's a rough stuff. And then the next day we were going to church and my mother, well there were five of us then, eventually eight, my mother put us in line and she said, are you going to go to church? And she said, you had better not let anybody know you're hungry So we promenaded through the church like hostages, single five. We knew that if we even hit it, that we hadn't eaten the day before, that judgment from my mother was swift and sure. We were trying to signal with our eyes to the people. This woman is going to hurt us and we're hungry. We are hostages and they ignore us. They become the I know happy nothing. What you talking about? You gotta look people in the eyes when you say happy sacrifice. <laughs> talking about the Lord is good, and they were wondering why we didn't say all the time. <laughs> we were trying to signal them we were hungry. <laughs> Let me tell you, I grew up in a church where people walked the talk. And every Sabbath, my mother and her five children were invited home for dinner. We were invited home so often, I thought we were celebrities. Where were we eating today? My mother was lying us up. She would say, now, Sister Lewis has invited us home for dinner. Now, children, if Sister Lewis says to you, did you have enough, what is your answer? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. We have had enough. And then my mother, knowing that, you know, she might throw up the curveball, she said, hold it, hold it, wait a minute, I'm not there yet. Now, what if Sister Lewis says to you, she's coming out of the kitchen and she says to you, can I get you something else? And the answer was not yet, ma'am. This time the answer was a little trick question. Next. No, ma'am, we are fine. We would march into Sister Lewis's house and that macaroni and cheese aroma would hit me. My knees would grow weak. <laughs> macaroni and cheese aroma. See, because the saints in those days, they made macaroni and cheese from that government cheese. That's what cheese had. So you crap and have anything on the government. That government cheese, that's real. That's serious mac and cheese with that government cheese. And it would be the best you've heard of roast. Be chowing down the whole time. I even had this during me, but when we a veggie burger, no! I remember the first time I lifted my hands and praised the Lord was over at Sister Brown's house, from the Sister Alberta Brown's house, and her veggie burger loaf. And then all of a sudden, the ominous question would be asked <laughs> Can I get you something else? And I knew the judgment would come, but I didn't care. <laughs> no pain, no gain. <laughs> I thank God for those devoted church people who brought flavor to my world. Tell you. And you know something? 
Most of the, the ladies who regularly invited us home for dinner lived abnormally long lives. Sister Lewis lived to be 103. Sister Alberta Brown lived to be 96. Okay. Sister Andretti is over 100 and still alive. They lived these abnormal lives, and I had the privilege, I had the privilege of giving the eulogy at each of the funerals. Praise God. Right there in Baltimore, Maryland, when they brought favor to my mother and her children, a single parent trying to rear children, they did not realize that they were feeding the only African-American admiral in the history of the Navy Chaplain Corps. They did not realize that they were feeding the 62nd Chaplain of the United States Senate. They brought favor to their world because they knew that by serving the marginalized and the lost, the lonely, and the least, they were serving Jesus Christ. They lived lives that matter. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Then if you're going to make your life matter, you must not only bring distinctiveness to your world and flavor to your world, but you must bring protection to your world. In the time of Christ, salt not only flavored, but it preserved. I believe that angels are holding back the winds of strife because of the prayers of godly people. Do you know that there are people who have retired, who walk, this is their job. They get up early in the morning, they come to the Capitol, and for the entire day they walk about and around the Capitol praying for our national leaders. I believe that one of the reasons why Flight 93 didn't make it to Washington, D.C. was because of the prayers of the saints. In Genesis chapter 18, God said to Abraham, I'm going to have to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham said, well, Lord, you're not going to destroy the innocent with the guilty. And Abraham played a numbers game with God. It's the first example in Scripture of somebody playing the numbers. He started out at 50, and he came all the way down to ten, and God said, for the sake of ten righteous people, he would save Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, let me tell you how wicked Sodom and Gomorrah was. When these heavenly visitors described, disguised as human beings came to Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible says that the men of the city, from the youngest to the oldest, came out to assault these visitors who now resided in Lot's house. And when they tried to attack, the angel stretched forth, one angel stretched forth his hand, and what happened to them? They were smitten with blind. But Genesis chapter 19 says that even blind, they broke for the door until they wearied themselves. Now, my sisters and brothers, I don't care what kind of pathology is going on inside of me, what kind of luck is disturbing me, if you supernaturally cut off the light, it's time for me to go home. You hear me? I, I don't Could somebody please take me home? These people were so consumed in their lust that even supernatural blindness did not deter them in their pursuit of their nefarious objective. And yet God said, for the sake of ten righteous, a city that steeped in iniquity, I will spare it. You are the greatest protection for America. Global terrorism is spiritual warfare. 
We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, says Ephesians 6, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. If someone is going to kill himself in order to destroy innocent people, don't you let anybody make you think that there is not an element of the demonic in that. Spiritual warfare requires spiritual weapons. Let me tell you some of the weapons you need in your arsenal if you're going to make your life count by bringing protection to your world. You need the weapon of prayer. Alfred Gordon Tennyson said, more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. James 5.16 says, the fervent, the, uh, the, the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous avail much. Verse 17 says, Elijah was a human being like us, and through the power of importunate prayer, he shut up the heavens for three and a half years. Make your life matter by harnessing the weapon of prayer. Make your life matter by harnessing the weapon of example. What you do speaks so loudly, people can't hear what you say. As you guess, put it this way, I soon can learn to do it if you let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lectures you deliver may be ever wise and true, but I'd rather get my message by observing what you do. You've got to live the life. Matthew 7 says, Not everyone who saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Be an example. Weapon number three, evangelize. Use evangelism. The mandate from our Lord in Matthew 28 is go into all the world and make disciples of humankind. We've been making members when we need to make disciples. Putting someone's name on the books of the church does not make a disciple. A disciple is a follower of Christ. And the Bible says we must make disciples of humankind. And we do that through evangelism. My mother had a fourth grade education, the daughter of a South Carolina sharecropper. She went, migrated to Baltimore, Maryland, living in poverty. And one day, a nameless person put a handbill in her mailbox. The topic read, the day money will be thrown in the streets of Baltimore, Maryland, and no one will stop to pick it up. My mother said to herself, I'm going to that meeting. I'm, I'm going to stay long enough to learn when the money will be thrown and where the money will be thrown. <laughs> then I'm leaving because I know somebody who will indeed stop to pick it up. She went for 12 weeks, and at the end of those 12 weeks, she was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. At that time, not a single person in her family had ever even finished college. She had three small children and one in the oven. You'll get that on the, on the drive home. And as she went down into the watery grave of baptism, she asked the Holy Spirit to place a special anointing on her unborn child, and I was that child. Don't you let anybody tell you that evangelism doesn't work. I, by the grace of God, God has through me baptized hundreds of souls, and that individual who put that handbill in my mother's mailbox some years ago will get to heaven, and here will come a crown laden with stars, and that person is going to want to know, when did I do anything that deserves this kind of recognition? This is what the scriptures mean when it says, many who are now first will 
be last. And many who are now last will be first. Use the weapon of evangelism. Use the weapon of persuasion. We need Christians who are apologists, defenders of the faith. We need people who know how to give a reason for the hope that is within them. Shame on you if every time you get into a religious discussion, you have to pull out your cell phone to call the pastor. I said, well, I, are, you, are you a Christian? Yes, I am. Well, I would like to be a Christian, too. How do you be? Well, let me get my phone out. I'm very hard what my pastor is. Uh, just, you have reached the voicemail of Pastor Roman. Would you please uh, with uh, another time, another place, we can help you out. You ought to know how to take them down the Roman road. Hallelujah. Ah, you ought to let them know the reason for the hope that is within you. And then you must use the weapon of suffering. There is something about undeserved suffering. Ladies and gentlemen, it is redemptive. If you're not suffering, check up on your life. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, let him or her deny self, take up his or her cross, and follow me. If you live it right, someone is going to tell lies about you sometimes. If you're living right, someone is going to gossip about you. If you're living right, someone is going to be envious of you. As we said this morning, you can rejoice and be exceedingly glad. You protect your work. Finally, if you're going to make your life matter, bring illumination to your world. Let your light shine. Francis of Assisi put it this way, preach the gospel when necessary, use words. Light without a sound illuminates. People are watching us. Let your light shine. I am not that fond of, of flying. I fly every week, sometimes two or three times a week. But the Bible says, Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Matthew chapter 28. I'm not, I'm not that fond of flying. And I must, I must be honest because confession is good for the soul. I have been guilty of racial profile. I get in the airport and I see someone dressed in Mid-Eastern clothing, I'm looking at it. When I get on the plane, I usually say to my seatmate, if he gets up and goes to the restroom, I've got the top, you got the bottom, you know, we're going to take, you know, get up, get up. So I was in the airport, waiting in the airport, I was in a hurry to catch the flight, and a lady came through with her Islamic garb, this, all of this attire, and you know how it is. These people are usually randomly selected for the super screen. You know, she went through the metal detector and nothing happened, but they, just as I expected, they said, Madam, would you please go over into the special section? And she went over, and I stopped and watched, and I mean, they did a search on this. They did a search on Girlfriend. I mean, they were, and she had this smile on her face and a spirit of equanimity, and I stood astonished. Because I've, I've heard people use profanity and get all upset with this search, but no, no, no problem at all. And I thought to myself, I said, she must be a Christian. There is no way anybody can go through a search like that with that kind of attitude and not be a Christian. And so I stuck around until she came out of her search and she was walking toward her gate and I came alongside her and I said, you're a Christian, aren't you? And she turned and with a beautiful smile on her face, she said, how did you know? <laughs> Light, illuminated, even kind of changing my mind. I, you know, you know I, 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 I'm getting better. I'm out of flying in certain situations. Because she was willing to make her life matter. Ready or not, 
death approaches. We shuffle off this mortal coil. But I want to live in such a way that I bring distinctiveness to my world. I want to live in such a way that I bring flavor to my world. I want to live in such a way that I protect my world. I harness the weapons of prayer and example and evangelism and persuasion and suffering for the cause. I want to live in such a way that I bring light to my world. And if I can just help one somebody as I pass along, if I can just cheer one somebody with a word or a song, if I can show one somebody he or she is traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian, or if I can spread salvation to a world that's wrong, if I can tell the story as the master taught, I would have lived a life that mattered, salt and light, and my living will not be in vain. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Are you willing to commit yourself to living a life that matters? Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you. Son of God, what a wonder you are. Holy Spirit, what a comfort you are. For you are the one who gives us the power to make our lives matter. Oh God, there are too many of us who have been closet Christians. We have not lived with the distinctiveness of a Daniel or a David. Too many of us, Lord, have diminished rather than enhanced our world. We have not brought flavor to our environment. Lord, too many of us, too many of us, are not protecting our world by sighing and crying before your throne. And you made it clear that if just your people would humble themselves and pray and seek your face, you would hear from heaven, forgive our sins and heal our land. You told us that, Lord, in Second Chronicles 7.14. Too many of us, O oh God, are fighting spiritual battles with carnal weapons. We do not pray as we should. We do not set the example that we should. We do not seek to make disciples. We do not suffer as we should. We do not even know the reason for the hope that is within us. And Lord, too many of us do not illuminate our environment by our example. And so, today we come to you and ask you to forgive us. We claim your promise in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins and we do, you are faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And by your grace and by your power, we make a commitment today to be salt and light in order to make our lives matter. And now while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you want to make that commitment by the grace of God, I make a commitment to bring distinctiveness, flavor, protection, and light to my world. 
I want you to just raise your hand. Just where you are. Lord Jesus, we stretch our hands to you right now. We make a commitment as we lift our hands toward heaven to be salt, to be light, to be like our Savior Jesus. Seal our commitments. And may we make such an impact on our world that people will glorify you and our living will not be in vain. In Jesus' name. Amen.